Good afternoon, everyone. My name's uh, Morgan Lander. I'm going to be running the next session. It goes for about 90 minutes. Thank you for coming along, giving up 90 minutes of your time. Uh, for anyone who came to my half-hour session yesterday, 90 minutes for me is a very short amount of time. So I'm not going to rush through information, but I know a lot of people love to take notes or uh, want to sort of quote verbatim what I talk about. The good news is the PowerPoint will be available after today. Uh, and there'll be plenty of opportunities to ask questions. So if you do have any questions during the session, by all means, just put your hand up and, and ask it. A um, Couple of things, I'm very relaxed in the way I present. If your phone is on, please don't panic if it goes off because you might drop it and it could break and I'll feel bad for a couple of a seconds. So if your phone goes off, don't, don't worry, I'll, I'll just keep going. Uh, secondly, if you need to stretch your legs, if you need to get up or move around, by all means, feel free to. I'll just keep ticking along. Uh, thirdly, for those who uh, didn't attend my session yesterday, some of the content that I discuss in my training is very confronting. Uh, it's very hard for you to hear uh, in, in doing this work for 12 years. Physiologically, my hair on the back of my neck stands up every time I talk about it. And it's, it's one of those things that, that I'm always curious about because I, I do talk about it a lot and I'm very passionate about it. But it's natural, if that happens to me, it's natural for you to feel quite confronted by the content. Uh, you should seek support if after today you find you're thinking about the content a lot. For some people in the room who haven't been involved in child safe systems or practices or child protection in sport previously, it'll be quite a shock. Uh, for others who are involved in that area of work, um, it doesn't get any easier listening to it. Uh, I quite often quote to our clients that I'd love to be out of work, I'd love to go and do another job. Um, not that it's not something I'm very passionate about, but if people didn't hurt kids, then we'd all have other work to do. So I appreciate you coming along to today's session. Um, I appreciate the fact that it is hard for you to hear. If you need to take a break, just step up out and, and, and grab a tea or a coffee or something. Um, not all of the content is about the, the harrowing cases that have uh, been before the Royal Commission, but there is a little bit of it. And, and the second half is more towards where to from here and, and, and what sport can do to, to, to ensure kids are safe. So please ask questions at any point. Even after today, um, I've got to actually fly to Melbourne this afternoon, so I will be leaving sort of 10 minutes after the session, but if you have any questions, my contact details are with the coordinators, um, and we're more than happy to have a chat with you after today. So a couple of things. You may or may not know, uh, some people obviously understandably don't, haven't looked into it in regards to the media, but there has been a, a Royal Commission that concluded in December last year uh, that ran for five years, and it focused on what's called institutional responses to child sexual abuse. And when you actually map that title, um, the fact that the, the government, when they were drafting what's called the letters patent, so establishing the scope of the Royal Commission, they purely focused originally on how organisations responded to allegations. They weren't focusing on how has it occurred, how much of it has occurred, but they actually looked at the failings of organisations when concerns were raised about child sexual abuse. I'm going to talk broadly about child safe in sport, but child sexual abuse sadly gets backsides on seats. Um, any organisation in Australia that has kids as clients or customers or members or participants uh, always wants to prevent child sexual abuse, but there are other types of harm that occur. And you'll see with the data that the Royal Commission collected, um, it was almost consistently 100% of the time that people who suffered child sexual abuse within a sporting context and within the sector also suffered other forms of abuse, and usually verbal abuse, psychological harm, physical assault, um, overtraining, et cetera, et cetera. So organisations' responses to child sexual abuse was an area that the federal government identified through some, some fantastic lobbying by lots of great heroes like the Fosters and a few other people, uh, 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 Peter and Chrissy Foster, whose daughters were sexually abused in an organisation. Um, they focused on when organisations become aware of child sexual abuse occurring. Uh, sadly, as the Royal Commission unpacked, and it went for five years and there were 57 public hearings and uh, over 8,000 people who attended the Royal Commission to have a private session, so they're a survivor of, the Royal, uh, of sexual abuse. It was identified that for sexual abuse to occur in any sector, and we'll talk about the sectors that were part of the Royal Commission, but for sexual abuse to occur to a child, it's a, it's a a scalable or it's a, um, a spectrum type 
instance. So what does the organisation have in place prior to it occurring? Did they have anything as a prevention tool or a proactive system to prevent it? Things like working with children check compliance, um, recruitment, all the way through to how did they respond and their failings in regard to responding. So being that it's only 90 minutes, I'm going to give you a snapshot of what's been learnt. A big thing for me, and I'm kind of glad that John didn't give me an intro, people always talk about experts in this field. In my opinion, there are no experts in, in the field of protecting kids. Um, you find systems that work in different organisations and different sectors, and even within a sector like sport, different systems will work or not work, depending on the way that your organisation is run and the services you provide to kids. So this is a, a, a concept that we came up with um, in conjunction with the Office of Sport in New South Wales to look at the way in which sport can respond effectively to ensure that the instances of child sexual abuse um, are reduced. To give you a bit of an idea in regard to um, the data that the Royal Commission collected, uh, being that they were uh, originally funded for one year and that was extended to three years and then extended to five years and it could have continued, um, they had a back-end system of, of policy and research and, and for someone who works in the industry of protecting kids, uh, it's the first real time in a long time that there's been research around child protection. And the research that they did and they collated and also the policy responses were quite, um, to use a, a very a very good term that was discussed yesterday in a negative context, but they were quite siloed in regard to different sectors. So out of home care, education, sport, religious organisations, etc. And the, the benefit for all of us in the room, uh, especially from a sporting context, was they actually delivered some key recommendations in relation to sport. So what was learnt through the sport experience and for the hearings that were conducted, um, I'll give you some data in regard to uh, the sporting context. Of 8,000 survivors that went to the Royal Commission had a private hearing and a private hearing or a private session related to a, a survivor coming forward and actually meeting with one of the seven commissioners as well as a support network of uh, psychologists and, and legal teams. Uh, they sat and met with them quite often for days on end and discussed their experience in regard to experiencing sexual abuse within the context of one of the sectors. Within a sporting context, 5% of the people who came forward of the 8,000 related or or detailed uh, their experience of sexual harm being in sport. Some of those survivors would have experienced sexual abuse in differing sectors. So they might have experienced sexual abuse in the school as well as in sport. Uh, and there's correlation for survivors of sexual abuse that people who perpetrate sexual abuse of a child quite often can identify a child who's been previously sexually abused because of their body language, their demeanour, um, the weight of the world that they carry on their shoulders, uh, their sort of apprehension to engage in certain social contexts can be trigger points for someone acquiring a victim. So within the context of 8,000 Australians, quite often adults, coming forward and saying they'd been sexually harmed and they'd survived that, 5% related to sporting organisations and people involved in sporting organisations. Interestingly, of the 3,000 plus or close to 4,000 organisations uh, that, that were mentioned, uh, as organisations where sexual abuse occurred, 10% of those organisations related to sport and recreation. And the definition or scope of sport and recreation was quite large, so it included scouts, it included recreational pursuits like bushwalking and all sorts of other things like that. So in the context of the Royal Commission, you may or may not know, you can go to their website uh, and it'll be linked into the resources section of uh, after today's conference. You can uh, email or, or make contact through the Royal Commission website and they will send you out the 17 volumes uh, hard copy volumes, free. I've got a set in our office. Um, it dictates the work that we do in regard to child safe practices because Royal Commissions, and, and everyone knows about the Banking Royal Commission that's going on now, but Royal Commissions historically give you very clear practical recommendations about the way to change what has occurred. So not only to prevent it, but how to manage internally within an organisation everything from culture, leadership, recruitment, responses, training, um, awareness, identifying risk, they will embed within their recommendations. And it's great that they make those resources publicly available. Even if you don't get the two boxes of 17 volumes, a sports specific volume came out, volume 14. Uh, it's a long read, it's a very beneficial read. And the hard thing for people like myself and, and, and in talking to John and the, and the coordinating team, the hardest thing for us is getting your boards and your senior management to actually read it. Uh, the boards and senior management were compelled to attend the Royal Commission when there were sport hearings. So there was a sport hearing in April 2016 that looked at football New South Wales, uh, cricket Queensland, tennis New South Wales, tennis Queensland, and there was a prior hearing that looked at swimming Australia and swimming Queensland. 
if your CEOs and your boards and the, the, the power brokers within your organisation aren't across child safe, there's nothing to say there won't be another Royal Commission in 10 years. And if your organisation and your sport weren't represented at the Royal Commission, so you weren't compelled to attend or provide evidence, it doesn't mean that if we had any other inquiries in the next 10 years that you might not be. Um, and it's a hard sell to say to your leadership group, this needs to be on your agenda. These things need to be front of mind when you have a lot of junior members involved in your organisation. For your larger commercial sporting organisations, um, it's quite often my experience, and we're talking AFL, Rugby League, Football Federation of Australia, and a few others like Netball who are emerging in the commercial context. Quite often, your power brokers and your decision makers and your board are purely focused on the, the high end, the elite, the corporate dollar, um, and they don't recognise that when you look at your annual reports, and I'm one of those odd people who downloads all of your annual reports and has a look at them, I find them quite fascinating. Uh, when you look at your financial breakdown and your membership structure and your stakeholder groups, your junior participants are a very large group and they are a contributing group and they, and they fund a lot of programs and services. But leadership within an organisation quite often ignore the fact that you have a lot of kids involved and the damage that can be done to both those children as well as your sport as a brand and, and a reputation is enormous if, if child sexual abuse or a fatality or something occurs. So within the context of uh, sport, there was some data that came out of this report. Uh, first and foremost, for anyone who has experience in child protection, this is where the content gets quite hard for people to listen to. Historically in Australia over the last 40 years, uh, criminal bureau statistics and and human services data will tell you that around about one in four girls under the age of 16 and one in six to seven boys under the age of 16 will have someone sexually abuse them or attempt to sexually abuse them. That hasn't typically captured peer-to-peer -peer harm, so peer-to-peer -peer sexually inappropriate or criminal behaviour, and it typically focused on an adult type uh, a perpetrator. So within the context of sport, when we look at if one to four girls, so 25% of girls, and one in six to seven, or so around about 15% of boys under the age of 16 will be sexually abused. Sport data that came out of the Royal Commission turns that on its head. It said that three out of four victims or survivors who came forward were male. And in the sporting context, there's a lot of uh, urban myths out there. If you're a robust, tough sport, like AFL, Rugby Union, and a few of the others, therefore there isn't a risk of sexual abuse. And that's not the experience of survivors before the Royal Commission. Um, historically, in, in the context of Australian society, 20, 30, 40 years ago, if you're a male victim of child sexual abuse, a perpetrator could very easily say to you, you're gay because you allowed me to do what I did to you as a young child, your friends will hate you if you come out and say that you're gay, there's shame and there's fear associated with that, so don't tell anyone about what occurred because I'll come out and say, no, it didn't occur, but even if it did, you're, excuse my language and the, and the horrible terms, you're, you're a fag, you're a poof, and as a result, that's detrimental to your own psyche. You fast forward in Australian context and teenagers nowadays, I believe, are far less homophobic. So young boys who are 13 or 14 now don't really care if their friends are gay, bisexual, whatever, and that's actually a protective system that works well for young male victims of child sexual abuse because the shame aspect of being gay isn't attributed to your harm. So in the context of sport, a lot of people would sit there and say young girls in sport are obviously at risk of sexual abuse. That's not the experience of the Royal Commission. The Royal Commission identified that a lot of middle-aged men between 20, let's call middle-aged 25 to 55 years of age, uh, came forward and said, this is my experience of sexual harm within a sporting context. When we look at the most common age cohort, 10 to 14 years of age is, is the most frequent uh, uh, age bracket that represented at the Royal Commission. Uh, in the context of my interpretation of that, it's when kids are usually transitioning from participation to accelerating their involvement in sports, spending more hours training, travelling, and they're going from participation to competitive type streams. Uh, as soon as a child, or even if you strip it back a little bit further, child protection works from the point of view, a starting point is if you're a child, whether you're six months old or whether you're 15 or 16, depending on which jurisdiction you're in, you are vulnerable in the fact that you can't defend yourself from sexual harm. So the fact that you're a child means you're vulnerable. When you add to that, that you could be living with a disability or recently arrived from overseas, or you might be low socioeconomic um, uh, uh, family who have access uh, issues in regard to transport to and from or paying for fees. All of these attributes add to an extra vulnerability. 
And within a sporting context, as soon as you get to the age to 10 or 14 years of age, you're going to be spending more hours involved in the sport and quite often that's when perpetrators or offenders would systematically try and pick out who their potential victims are. People who target any child for sexual abuse don't target assert assertive, confident kids. They tend to go the opposite. Who's a vulnerable child? Who's a child who potentially is socially a little bit isolated? Who's a child who comes from a broken family? Uh, parents who work at night and they have to be transported to and from events? Or kids who suffer harm in, in the home? So if there's domestic violence in the home, you don't wait at home for someone to physically assault you. You put yourself in programs and activities outside of the home. You want to avoid being at home. If there's sexual abuse in the home, you don't rush home from school and hope that it occurs. You do the absolute opposite. You ensure that you're not in the home environment. So lots of kids who participate in sport can be motivated to join sport because there's risk and harm at home. And when you look at 8,000 survivors went to the Royal Commission, the scope of the Royal Commission was just focusing on organisations and institutions. It didn't capture home-based risk, family-based risk. It actually captured organisations that offer services and programs to kids. So it's quite alarming within the child protection space that so many people came forward, so many survivors. But then when you correlate that with data outside of the Royal Commission, anywhere from 80 to 85% of sexual harm occurs within a home-based environment with someone they know and trust. So kids quite often put themselves into sport to avoid risk at home. As soon as kids are spending more hours in sport, it correlates with a potential risk going up. When you look at 50% uh, experience sport for up to 12 months, most sports are seasonal. And in the context of someone who perpetrates sexual abuse, in any season you could potentially target someone for harm. But a lot of sports will have adults who provide coaching or managerial type services staying in just the under 13s bracket or just the under 8s bracket. So in the context of seasonal type offending, 8% of people experience abuse for over or up to six years. And I could almost guarantee you that that 8% of survivors that came forward are involved in individualised sports where you have someone who you work with over the long course of time. There's a natural correlation, you know, out in the wider sporting world that the more time you spend with adults who aren't your primary carers, the more risk that goes up. So in 2002, the Australian Sports Commission did a study where they surveyed people involved uh, in sport as an adult and they said, if you're involved in junior sport, we want to speak to you. And it wasn't sort of capturing any sort of uh, uh, potential risk prior to it. They just did a random sample. And they asked lots of questions about their involvement in sport, including a section talked about, now that you're an adult participating in sport, in junior sport, were you ever sexually harmed? And they used appropriate terminology. And they were dealing directly with adults. And the research indicated that for the respondents, and it wasn't a huge pool, but for the respondents, 25% of them experienced sexual abuse in a club type structure. So participation, less elite, less competitive. But then when you progress to elite sport, so individualised or a team based sport where you're spending more time with adults away from your carers, it jumped to uh, a third. And people sort of go 25% to 33% isn't that much. You're now talking about one in three participants in sport in that scope of uh, the research indicated they've been sexually harmed or someone had been sexually inappropriate towards them because they've been involved in elite sport. So a lot of sports tend to sort of, even with the Royal Commission after it's concluded, a lot of sports said, we haven't had this happen in our backyard. We haven't had anecdotal experience or historical experience of people coming forward. And my response without trying to be an alarmist is that you know of. So within the context of your sport, if your sport doesn't know of sexual harm, it doesn't mean it hasn't occurred. Or if your sport doesn't know of inappropriate behaviour towards kids, violence, etc., it doesn't mean that it hasn't occurred. It just means you're not aware of it. Uh, I worked in an agency in New South Wales, Children's Guardian, and Karen Boland, who, who's been involved in child protection for more than 30 years, used to very bluntly say to me, organisations understand child safe practice when they understand it's going to occur harm to a child is going to occur. Not it hasn't, and we, we're going to prevent it. You have to plan for preventing, and as well as when it does occur, how do we respond? And there are organisations here, national and state organisations here in the room, who have already started to map those types of procedures. What are we doing in a prevention space? What are we doing to react to allegations when they come up? Because you're not really meeting the needs of kids if you're only planning for prevention. For example, criminal record checking or working with children checks. If you're planning for the broader scope of how would we respond, how would we support a victim, how would we recognise that kids have the right to come forward and raise these concerns, and the worst thing a sport can do is tell them they're not welcome to come back, 
So we talk about diver uh, diversity and inclusion and, and being welcoming to all people and they're treated equally. Kids are quite often told when they make an allegation, whether it be I was sworn at or whether it be I was sexually abused by someone in a sport, the most common response that people experience is we understand that's your experience but you, you can't be involved anymore. That's too damaging for our organisation, it's too risky for you, we don't know what to do as a response. When you look at, um, as I mentioned earlier, up to a third of people who experience sexual abuse within sport also experience other types of harm. We have a very grey definition of what is harm to a child in the context of sport outside of sexual abuse. So what is overtraining, what is physical assault, what is psychological harm? Everyone talks a lot about the spectator behaviour and inappropriate parents on the sideline. Quite often if you're a very well respected and liked coach, you're allowed to overstep the mark in regard to abusing your players or your participants. I was at an under 12s, I guess you'd call it elite because I vicariously lived through my child and he's a football superstar and he's going to buy us a house in Spain one day. Um, but you'd call it elite football or soccer in New South Wales. And I was at the game on Sunday and uh, one of the fathers who refereed his daughter's match the hour before and came along to the event said, and he's a qualified referee, he's a high level referee and it's elite girls soccer and he said this was an under nines match and the coach of the other team before the game started was ripping into his team not motivating them criticizing about how they played last week and talking to them about how bad they were last week and how he doesn't want to see that today and during the game in the first half the coach was screaming at the girls at half time coach is screaming at the girls second half the girls are disinterested and starting to give up so he's losing his mind even further and then after the game, he's abusing the crap out of them to the point where parents were going and saying to their daughters, come on, let's go. So the coach has lost his mind. And I sat there and like a lot of people in the room, you're probably fairly assertive and, and, and like kids being safe. So I straight away turned to him and I have a, I guess you'd call it a mixed opinion of this person due to his refereeing style, because um, he referees our matches. Um, and I said, did you do anything as a referee? Did you at any point intervene? And he said, no, that's the club's responsibility. Uh, that's something that, that sits with the club. And I said, well, you're talking about it to us because it hurt and confronted you. Have you even asked your daughter who was there with us? I said, have you asked your daughter how she felt? And he said, no, no, like, she'll be fine. And I said, even your daughter competing against the team where the coach is like that, it's going to have an impact on her. And I said, that's an opportunity that you've missed where you could stop a game. You're a referee. You're quite an influential person on the day. You could stop a game and say your behaviour is inappropriate let's just take five minutes as a water break and you need to check that, otherwise it's not going to continue. And he went into the bylaws of the game and I don't have the power to do that and et cetera, et cetera. And it always puzzles me that people's responses when we talk about other types of abuse of children will be grey, but when you talk about child sexual abuse, people then say, oh, this is catastrophic, we have to act, we have to do something. A lot of the other types of harm are far more common, far more common that you'll see psychological harm to kids in sport than you will sexual abuse. But sexual abuse is the, is the, the hot topic in, in regards to the Royal Commission. The, we could have a Royal Commission for 10 years on, on psychological harm of kids in sport. Uh, read Elena Dokic's book. Uh, speak to anyone involved in, in, in sport where they've got to an elite level and then dropped out quite suddenly and it usually as a response of harm that occurred in the hands of an adult. A couple of other things to think about in regards to the data. And this is not me trying to be funny, but you sometimes need to lighten the load. Hopefully you do laugh after that because it would look really bad. But when it talks about single perpetrator, it's not saying their marital status, it's actually saying that people most likely offended by themselves. There's lots of misinformation out there about people who collude to sexually abuse children. The media will show you um, online child, po child pornography networks. Uh, one of the hardest days in my job was 2007 when, that, when 1196 Australians were arrested in 24 hours for accessing a child pornography website. And everyone sort of reads that or sees on the news and says that's probably deviant, horrible people. And the federal police were very good. They said we used every policing agency in Australia and we systematically raided and arrested 1,196 people. Male, female, youngest was 16, oldest was 96, school teachers, butchers, police officers, federal police officers, politician, bankers, real estate agents, and they effectively systematically broke down the stereotypes. People who access child pornography online in Australia, 98% of them don't have a criminal history. So they've never been before a court, they've never been arrested, but they then go and access child pornography or child abuse material. And a lot of people say that's something that I wouldn't know anyone who's done it. 
the reality is you probably know someone who's looked at that stuff and they may have been caught or may not. People don't talk about it. They don't go to a barbecue and say, oh, I was on this website on the weekend, you should have a look. So 1,200 people are arrested and Australia tend to sort of say, oh, we, we do pretty well in regard to our kids. You have to break the stereotypes of you can't identify a potential perpetrator. A lot of people sit there and say, in sport, we would have grave concerns about someone who's weird or different or couldn't communicate well or is obsessed with kids or fascinated by children. Perpetrators of sexual harm of kids in sport or in schools or anywhere else, almost every time they're arrested, people close to them, family, as well as people who volunteer or work with them, the most common response you'll hear is, they're the last person I suspected would be capable of that or I don't believe they actually did it. There are cases after case that went before the Royal Commission where the starting point for people who worked alongside perpetrators, their starting point would be, I never suspected that person could be capable of it. And the reason being that if you want to offend against kids, you've got to be very good at grooming the adults around you. My training usually starts with, look at me as if I'm a sexual offender. And people sort of squirm around awkwardly and say, oh, you shouldn't say that. And I, my response is, put in the evaluation if you'd like to. I work for myself, I don't care how you evaluate me. But the reality is, if you need to change your mentality and your leaders need to change the mentality about how to prevent harm to kids, you have to change this idea of we can figure out who does it. Anyone who works in child protection knows it'd be really easy if we knew who was going to do it because we'd just monitor and arrest them as soon as we found out. But people who perpetrate sexual harm of kids are almost never detected previously because you're working with children checks rules them out. So if I have a prior history for it, and it's been investigated, I probably can't join your sport, no matter what state or territory it is. But if I'm good at it, I haven't been caught. And of course I have a working with children check clearance or a criminal record clearance, because that's the first thing I need to be able to sell to you that I'm a safe person. So I have a working with children check clearance in New South Wales. I've had three since 2002. I have a national criminal history background check that I conducted three months ago that shows I've never been before a court in Australia for an indictable offence. All these other things that effectively mean that I'm legally eligible to join your organisation. Doesn't mean I'm a safe and fit and proper person to be around kids. I have four boys, I volunteer in football, I don't show a lot of interest in any other volunteering. But because I work in this space, a lot of people automatically presume that I'm safe. And what if I was sexually offending? It effectively could be the perfect cover. It could literally be the best way for me to access kids to harm them. You may or may not know that police in Australia go on to sexually offend against kids. People who work in statutory child protection agencies have been caught sexually offending against kids. Because if you want to access vulnerable children who have been previously harmed, why not be in a statutory position where you're on the front line offering services to help protect kids and then systematically bluff them into believing that what you're doing is appropriate. So don't go out after today and speak to people in the organisation and say, child safe systems seems like a good idea, but we'll heavily rely on working with children checks and we'll start from there because that's your legal compliance. And we don't offer legal advice. We say to organisations and our clients, go and sort your legal compliance out and then we'll come and work with you about culture within the organisation. And a lot of diversity and inclusion systems that we've learned about in the last two days start with the culture. Doesn't matter what you have on paper or how inclusive you are, are you thinking about the add-ons to compliance? Are you thinking about the way in which organisations can make it hard for offending? And when we talk about no typical perpetrator profile, a lot of people go, oh, we're, we're child safe because we, we watch out for dodgy behaviour or people that are weird. Weirdos don't end up offending. Um, Queensland Cricket, when we were doing some work with them a couple of years ago, invited associations along and someone came along with the sole intention of asking this one question. We've got a guy who's homeless who lives on the bench out the front of our club. How do we get rid of him because we're scared he could hurt kids? And I sort of looked around and, and thought I'd been set up. And I, I said, let's unpack that for a second. You think the person who's homeless living out the front of the bench in a sleeping bag is likely to abduct a child and sexually abuse them? And they said yes. And I said, I understand how you've come to that point, but let's start to ask some questions. Have kids ever said they feel uncomfortable around the homeless guy out the front? No. Has the homeless guy out the front ever invited a child to get in the sleeping bag with him and say, let's sit here and engage in inappropriate conduct? No. Has anyone ever interacted with this bloke? No. While you're focusing on the homeless guy out the front, what are you doing about the people in your organisation who drop kids to and from training without telling anyone else about it? Or invite them to your house on the weekend to watch the test match and have pizza in my, in my lounge room and no one knows about it? Or engaging with them through social media because they're part of the organisation and that could be a risk, not the guy who's out the front. The bloke out the front's probably looking for how he gets his next feed. He's not looking to target a child.
that's something that you're sort of missing the point in regards to the context of child sexual abuse. So in, in regard to who's the risk, even the Royal Commission after five years can't tell you who the risk is. I can't tell you who the risk is. What you look for is the way in which you layer systems within your organisation to make it hard for any person to do the wrong thing. The environment in which kids are exposed to adults and the way they interact with adults is the focus point for child safe systems, not the individuals. Effectively, if your organisation's tracking along well, it doesn't matter who joins the organisation and engages with kids, it's going to be hard for them to do the wrong thing. If it's easy for them to do the wrong thing, it's risky. If it's hard for people to do the wrong thing and there's a disincentive for them to try, that's far safer for children. In regard to the identified areas of an organisation that the sporting survivors disclose, these were the key areas and not in any particular order. People who went to the Royal Commission and were survivors, the Royal Commission indicated that offending quite often occurred at camps, overnight events or overnight stays or overnight competitions. Now, if you're in my session yesterday, we quite often, I'm going to sort of recite something I said yesterday. Most sporting organisations, when they ask parents to consent to their child travelling overnight, give three or four pages of sleeping bag, pillow, no nut snacks, um, mobile phone, contact details, Medicare number, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I understand you need those logistics, but it's very rare for a sport to say, and, and, and the government agency down here, Office of Sport and Recreation and Racing, actually have a very good checklist and guide that talks about if you are travelling overnight, are you telling parents and kids and informing them about the sleeping arrangements, where they access bathrooms, who's going to be responsible for their supervision, how they can raise a concern if they're worried. And it might be a concern about, I don't like sleeping in the dark. It might be a concern about, I don't like the food. It might be a concern about one of the kids in my room was inappropriate towards me or it might be a concern about one of the adults that's their duty of care and responsibility that night. But actually giving people empowered information, and for me a big thing, telling kids about what to expect for programs that are overnight camps and trips away from their guardians and carers, reduces the likelihood of an adult targeting them for harm. Uh, sadly, for 12 years, I've constantly focused on the way that people offend. So there's lots of data and literature out there that will actually talk to you about the way that people target children for harm. And the best way I can describe it to you in a short amount of time is, if anyone, hopefully you've seen it, if you haven't seen it, you should watch it tonight because it's a great movie. Jurassic Park, the original movie, has, I believe it's a T-Rex, and it's the stormy night when it's raining, and the T-Rex systematically tests the electric fence to see where the weakness is. So while they're stuck in an upside-down car and it's a gripping score and musical, theatrical-type involvement, you see this dinosaur show intelligence to try and find out where the best part of the fence to breach to then target this family for harm. That's effectively what offenders do. That's the best way I can describe it. They look at your systems and your programs and your activities and say, if I was going to target kids, when would I do it? And a most common response would be when they're away from their parents. Because if you're away from your parents or your guardians or your carers, you can't quickly raise an alarm. The Royal Commission has produced 10 child safe standards that they have recommended become national standards, and that could be through law or they can be principles that are applied even within your organisation. So after today, you could say, let's work on these 10 standards right now. There's nothing that's stopping you from doing that. Within those 10 standards, quite pleasingly, they talk about the involvement of families and they actually recognise the risk management that applies if you have families involved in your organisation. That correlates very well with inclusion. We, hear, we have heard a lot in the last two days about we want to be inclusive of new participants or members and a way to do that is to include their community and their family. That's a great protective measure for kids because if members of the family participate, for example, chaperone and go on an overnight trip, if it's not just volunteers in your organisation or paid staff from the state sport organisation, if it's family members, even if it isn't my family member and I'm 10, but it's the mum or dad or uncle or auntie or grandparent of one of the guys or girls in my team, I will go to them if there's a concern because I know them and they're known to me. So things like managing risk can be as simple as, let's get families involved in overnight camps. I don't know of a lot of sporting organisations that still do billeting. Um, it's sort of been phased out a fair bit across Australia. For those who grew up in sport, quite often billeting was your experience. And you can understand how harrowing that is for a young participant in sport. You're going to travel to New Zealand and we're going to compete over there for two weeks and you're going to stay with a family that we assign that you'll meet on the first day. So we'll drop you off there and you'll stay in their home without any of your other teammates or sometimes you'd have another teammate with you. 
and you're going to stay with them and immerse yourself in their family life. And understandably, if you had a predisposition to target kids for sexual harm, you'd probably put your hand up for billeting because it's a short-term engagement with a child who doesn't have any adults who are responsible for them and they've been told beforehand, when you go there, make sure you behave and do the right thing. Don't embarrass our sport. And as a result, it's a risky environment. Within the context of change rooms and what we call obscure environments, there's a huge amount of work that you can do starting today to manage risk within change rooms and environments around your clubhouses and your facilities. Situational prevention has been around for many decades and situational crime prevention, for anyone who's ever heard of behavioural economics or behavioural experts, talks about the way that all of us interact with our environment. The Royal Commission did a bit of work with what's called Professor Stephen Smallbone and Smallbone and Wartley are two uh, academics out of the Griffith University who have spent the last 20 years learning from offenders within a child sexual abuse context and applying what they learn from them to mitigate risk. Their number one recommendation they've had for 20 years is create safe environments. Forget about individuals, create safe environments. You have child safe environments in South Australia for those who are representing South Australian organisations. It focuses on if I was to do an activity in this room as an example. If I had kids in here on a, on a cold rainy day and they're meant to be out on the oval doing an activity, like I was kicked but they can't because it's freezing cold and raining, we bring them in here. If I was to set up an environment that is conducive to kids feeling comfortable, I'd leave the doors open, all the blinds would be up, I'd have good lighting, I'd have kids spread out around the room and they feel more comfortable. If I want to target them for harm, I'll make an excuse as to why I need to close the doors, things like, oh, they might run away. So because I don't want kids to run away, I'll close the doors, so I'll lock them in. I'll close the blinds because it's glary and I'll systematically try and ensure that no one can see me operating within the room. So I'll make examples like, please don't disturb the first two hours of your activity because it's, it's very, very important. And that gives me two hours of time in which I can target kids for harm. If there's closed circuit TV, very hard for you to offend and get away with it. It's why we see in, in a broader community context, closed circuit TV works very, very well. We originally grew up with it here, you're under surveillance when you're in a shop, don't shoplift. And you'll see those signs. And if you ever go to a shop nowadays, they'll have the sign, but quite often they don't have the cameras. But the fact you see the sign, I'm not saying that I have a predisposition to shoplift, I'm quite interested in risk management, but in the context of visual aids, if I know I'm under surveillance, I'm going to behave better. It's one of those very natural human instinctive responses. If I know I'm likely to be filmed, I'm probably not going to do the wrong thing. And in your common areas, closed circuit TV works quite well. Not in a change room context, because it's unlawful, or in a bathroom context, but your environments and the way you set them up reduce risk to kids. To apply situational prevention in other contexts, because a lot of people sort of go, oh, that's great, but we don't have money for closed circuit TV, or we don't often do activities inside, so that doesn't apply to what we do. Overnight camps and trips is one of those areas where you should be managing situational prevention. Things like, if I take a team away and we stay in a hotel or a motel or a caravan park or cabins, etc., it shouldn't just be a natural thing that I go into their personal space. So I go into their bedroom at any point, knock on the door and I walk straight into their room. Or I allow kids to come into my room. Most adults want a little bit of separation in, in regard to their involvement with kids. If I took kids away, I'd say then my room's out of bounds and your room's out of bounds for me. Kids understand terminology like out of bounds. Not exclusion, not other types of things, pro prohibited, etc. They understand out of bounds because when you go to school, that area's out of bounds. When you're at childcare, that's out of bounds. So they, they understand terminology. If I want to meet with my team, I should meet in an open area. And uh, after today, you'll probably see it. If you travel a lot for your work, and there are sporting teams, especially junior sporting teams, in a hotel that you're at, you'll quite often see them have a team meeting in the foyer or in the, the reception area because adults don't feel comfortable saying to the whole team, come in my room and sit on my bed and we'll have a team meeting. It makes kids feel uncomfortable and it makes appropriate adults feel uncomfortable. So you can manage environments very, very easily without having policy procedures. You just mentor people to say, when you're on overnight trips, be mindful of, that can make kids feel uncomfortable use your own bathroom, don't go into their bathroom, give them 20 minutes to have a shower and get dressed. You don't need to supervise them when they're in a change room or a bathroom. If they're over the age of six, they can independently go to the toilet. They don't need you to stand there and supervise them. Kids don't hurt themselves going to the toilet. They've been doing it their whole life. At home, their parents don't stand in the bathroom while they go to the toilet. Their parents don't stand in the shower and watch them have a shower or watch them get dressed. 
So there's no need for adults representing a sport to do it. So in that context, situation prevention works quite well. Line of sight works well. Things like supervision, observation. Um, I've got a, a funny story that a few people in the room have already heard before. When I volunteered to become a soccer coach, um, I played soccer my whole life, loved the sport, very time poor, so I don't volunteer much in the community. And my wife, while I was doing a, a member protection session on a Saturday morning, my wife registered my 12-year-old stepson in the local area in the football club. And I had five missed calls from my stepson during my, my training workshop. And I, I rang him back and I said, mate, what's going on? Thinking there's been a car accident, something's gone wrong. And he said, oh, mum's done the worst thing. She's put her hand up to be my coach in, in soccer. And I'd imagine most people in the room are passionate about sport. My wife doesn't watch sport, has never played a sport, doesn't know the rules of any sport, wouldn't be able to name a sport. And we have quite a con conflicting sort of uh, issue there in our home, especially during the football season and watching on TV. And it was that classic scenario where all the parents sat there and the convener of the, the club said, oh, we've got an under 12s team, we've got 14 kids who are registered, fantastic, you're all here, who's gonna coach? And all the parents just looked down at the ground and kicked the dirt. And my wife, after a couple of minutes, goes, I'll do it if no one else will do it. And my stepson was mortified. So I let that stew for a couple of days and let everyone panic. And then I said, I'm happy to coach. And I, I emailed the club and said, my wife put her hand up. She's, she's a bit too busy. Uh, I'm going to be the coach. My name is Morgan. I'm Alex's stepdad. And the club automatically sent me the code of conduct for coaches. And they didn't just say, you need to tick this box and then you comply. They said, please print this off, read it, come to us at the first night of training and ask any questions you have about the code of conduct, sign it, date it, and give us a copy. Please bring a copy with you, not the original. Keep the original yourself, bring a copy. And they even said, if you don't have a copy on the night, you can photocopy it in the clubhouse. So we'll retain a copy and you keep a copy. Now, starting from the point of view of codes of conduct, which we'll talk about in a second, most of your organisations, from what I see on your websites, when people register as a coach or a manager, you might need to meet a certain level of accreditation and part of that accreditation will be acknowledging your code of conduct. Most of it is scroll through to the bottom of the page and tick a box. It's, it's rare nowadays you actually sign and date something. Now, if I want to plead ignorant as a coach in your organisation and I'm swearing at kids during the first week and someone says, that's in our code of conduct, that's a breach. My response would be, sorry, I didn't read it. I just whizzed through it, ticked the box at the bottom. I know it says I need to agree and abide by it, but I, I didn't do that. So now that you've told me not to swear at kids, I promise I won't do it again. People love to plead ignorant in regard to codes of conduct. So I sign this code of conduct, I hand it over the first week of training and I start training the under 12s. Um, and I'd never coached before so I made it fun and you know, I was out of my depth in regard to skill development, I just wanted them to have a ball. Three weeks later after two trial games and three nights of training on a Tuesday night, the junior coordinator came over to me at the end of our training at 8.30 in the dark and said, hi I'm Keith, we met when you first brought your code of conduct back just letting you know that we've been watching you for the last three weeks and we'd like to keep you on as the coach. And I said, oh, when you say watching me, what, do, what does that imply? Like, what are you talking about? And he said, we observe everyone who's new to the organisation. We actually monitor you. We keep a close eye on you. We attend your trial games. We watch you at training. And I said, oh, I haven't seen anyone at my games or at training. And he said, oh, no, at the games we're at quite a distance. We usually sit in the car. And at training we, we spend our time over there. And he points to this literally bushland area and he goes we we hang out over there in the bush and I went oh we're gonna have a chat about that in a second but <laughs> so effectively I said to him you're implying that you monitored and supervised me while I was coaching and he and he said yeah absolutely and I said mate yeah haven't told you yet. this is what I do for a job this is brilliant I've never heard of this before do you mind if I use this in my training because effectively what you're saying is we don't just take anyone we get you to sign a code of conduct and then we watch them and he said absolutely he said we look for swearing inappropriate behavior turning up late leaving early smoking around the kids etc abuse of officials he said if that happens we just politely say to someone you're not you're not the best person to coach you're welcome to be a parent spectator but we're going to get another coach and I said, this is the first time I've ever heard of probation for a volunteer coach in an organisation. I said, it's great, but what happens if I misbehaved? So you terminate me and say, not fit to be coach, who coaches? And he said, that's when we get a little bit of a speed bump. Usually all the other parents won't want to do it, so one of the committee does it. And I said, so effectively committee um, coaching teams. And he said, yeah, he said, one season I coached five teams. And I said, oh, your wife must hate that. And he said, my wife's on the committee, she coaches three a year as well. 
So they had a zero tolerance for adults behaving inappropriately towards kids. Yes, it's hard to fill coaching roles. Yes, a lot of people don't put their hands up, but they literally said, if you don't meet our standards of behaviour, you're not welcome to stay on as a coach. I don't endorse or accredit or recommend any organisation, and I found myself at the local primary school gate when I was talking to other parents, because we were new to the area, a lady said to me, my daughter wants to play soccer. Do you know it? Oh, go to Abbotsford Club. This club's amazing. You know, you should see what they do. They're brilliant. And I remember walking away going, I can't believe I just endorsed an organisation. What if they're not good at what they do? What if something goes wrong? She's going to say that I recommended them. But my experience as a volunteer coach, having been monitored and supervised, gave me a huge amount of respect for the way they did things. And it's not written in a policy, it's not written in a framework, it's just the way they operate their organisation. We were there for three years, I never saw a parent misbehave at any of my games. I never saw a coach being inappropriate towards a child. We played against a lot of clubs that did that, but effectively the culture within the club was, this is a zero tolerance organisation. Kids need to come along and have fun, and if they don't have fun, it's probably going to be the hands of their adults, and as a result, you won't be fit to be here. A lot of people sort of go, okay, well, was the club popular? The club was at its maximum capacity. So they had five fields that were assigned to them by the council. They, their biggest problem was trying to get all the new teams time on the training paddock. And they're a successful club. Most age groups were, were winning the competition. Our, our team did. We didn't lose a game. Absolutely no influence of mine. Uh, they were very good players. Uh, but as a result, people gravitated towards wanting to be involved in this club. And market share for all of you. Like, I'm a realist. I know you're all looking at market share. I know some of the bigger sports have sent along 15 staff to effectively say to the other sports, look at how big we are. That's great. I think that's fantastic. But the reality is market share works. And market share works for your leaders. When you're talking about child safe, actually saying to your boards and your committees, we will grow our market share if we have a reputation for doing things well to reduce risk to kids. Because parents talk. They all talk about it. If they have an unpleasant experience, they talk about it. If they have a pleasant experience, they talk about it and people will gravitate towards joining your sport or your sector or your industry or your association or even your club if they know that other people will vouch for them. And as I said, I don't vouch for a lot of organisations and I found myself selling this organisation to other parents. This is a place you should come along because they treat kids with the right respect. A couple of other things to think about. The Royal Commission identified these types of opportunities um, and influences. I, I, I really had to sort of control myself when I read about this term coaching relationships. Um, when you coach kids, it's not a relationship, it's a service, it's an it's, it's a, it's a engagement that you're providing to kids. There are lots of sports that have a history of coaches sexually abusing children, so under the age of 16, and people interpret it, even the media interpreting it in the 90s and the early 2000s, as there was a relationship between a player and a coach. Lots of sporting organisations nowadays, from an ethics point of view and a professional standards point of view, even with adult participants, will say it's a conflict of interest for you to be in a relationship if you're in a position of power and authority, like a coach or a team manager or a selector, and there's a member or participant that you're in a relationship with. When we're talking about kids, they're not relationships. It's aggravated sexual assault. And the, 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 the shift away from relationships is really important. Um, I was at a conference once where someone was discussing the fact that adults in positions of power and authority will have relationships and a lady from sexual assault counselling said it's, it's not a relationship, it never will be. A child under 16 doesn't have the mental capacity to consent to that behaviour and as a result it's an imbalance of power and it's not a relationship, it's assault. So in the context of grooming opportunities, and for those who haven't heard the term grooming before, grooming is, is the pre-behavioural pre or um, sexual misconduct behaviour that comes prior to sexual assault. It's very hard for someone to sexually abuse a child without first grooming either the child or the people around them. And grooming behaviours are anything from discussing sexual content, so talking about their own sexual orientation, experience, knowledge, quizzing kids about their own sexual experience, or embedding within conversations. And when we talk about, for example, a sporting context, there isn't a scenario where you would discuss sex with players or participants. But adults will ingrain it within conversations periodically or selectively to try and acquire potential victims. Um, kids will sexually harass adults. And even when that happens, adults should be geared and structured and supported to raise those concerns. Because kids sexually harassing adults is inappropriate and adults shouldn't experience that. But if they turn a blind eye to it or try and not tell anyone about it and hope it goes away, 
And that child, six months later, says, oh, by the way, I've been sending these text messages to Morgan, my coach, and they're highly inappropriate. It looks like I've condoned that behaviour. It looks like I've participated in that engagement when I should have come forward and said this shouldn't occur and it's not allowed to occur. So in regard to coaching relationships, turn away from that and turn more towards, if I'm a coach, I have a duty of care to ensure that I don't engage inappropriately with kids. Because in a coaching context, when the Royal Commission says, here's an opportunity, it shows that the most common scenario would be a coach would go on to sexually offend. When it talks about vulnerability, I mentioned it before, people who target children for sexual abuse quite often require a lot of victims. Uh, when they acquire a lot of victims, they look for particular characteristics in their victims. So when we talk about characteristics, we don't know offender characteristics, but we do know victim or survivor characteristics. And a child who has experienced harm previously, whether that be domestic violence, um, uh, neglect, psychological harm or sexual abuse at the hands of someone else, is a potential victim for someone within a sporting context to target them as well. Most people in sport treat kids very, very well. So when kids experience with sport, if they start at a young age and they progress through the years, if a lot of adults in sport treat them really well and respect them and behave appropriate towards them, it's natural that they would gravitate towards building a rapport with those adults they're involved in. And when they build a rapport, quite often they'll talk about troubles at home. They'll talk about concerns they have about home or they'll disclose things that you're obligated to notify child protection services about, so mandatory reporting people who gravitate towards sexually abusing children will look for those opportunities. They'll build rapport with kids, it sounds horrific and it is horrific, in the hope that when a child discloses other types of risk, they'll say, I'll be the shining light, I'll be the, the knight, I'll be the person who will help you, but then target them for sexual harm as a result. When we talk about the cultures within sport, and culture has been discussed at length in the last couple of days, and I love that because things that are on paper will do a role and play a role, but your culture will lead a lot of things, including child safe practice. Normalising sexual cultures within sport is, is ingrained in what we do. Um, if anyone recalls the Rio Olympics, Saudi Arabia had a beach volleyball team in the women's beach volleyball that were allowed to compete. So not only the Olympic Committee, but the International Women's Beach Volleyball Federation, which is very heavily skewed towards a male decision-making group, so there wasn't gender equality there in their decision-making, they said, we are very inclusive. We've allowed Saudi Arabia to submit a team for women's beach volleyball. And the Saudi Arabian team were allowed to wear a uniform that included skins type um, uniform, which was to the wrist and to the ankles. And the International Women's Beach Volleyball Federation came out and said, that's a really good thing that we've done. We're inclusive. And several of the other Western countries said, we'd like to actually have a choice with the uniform we wear. We're not comfortable wearing a G-string while competing on the international stage with billions of people watching. We've asked for many years and lobbied for many years to be afforded the opportunity to decide what our uniform would be, including can we wear the men's shorts and the men's singlet? And the International Women's Beach Volleyball Federation's argument for why that wasn't going to occur was our sponsors prefer you wear that uniform. So Coca-Cola, McDonald's, the big multinationals. And when they released that statement, Coca-Cola immediately came out and said, on the women's uniform and a G-string and a bikini, our logo is about this big. On the men's uniform, which is a singlet, our logo is double the size of this. We're a corporate organisation that pay a lot of money to sponsor. We want this. We don't want this. This doesn't look good on TV. This looks really good on TV, our logo. Don't blame us for having your rules about wearing a G-string as a uniform. So the association, or the federation said, it's the corporate dollar that dictates you wearing a G-string. And the corporate said, absolutely not. We'd love the women to wear a singlet because our logo would be 100 times the size. The federation has normalised a sexual culture for the sport. And they think it's beneficial to the sport. The irony is that if you're a child and you want to compete in beach volleyball, you know right from the outset, my body, uh, protection or the way in which I can apply protection to my body at the hands of not just adults in the organisation but people seeing parts of my body, I don't get any empowerment there. I don't get any decisions or I'm not allowed to actually make decisions. Um, it sounds like it's a joke but it's not. I don't know of a child in fencing ever being harmed in a sexual nature. Now fencing, you're covered from head to toe in protective gear and you have a weapon, or I shouldn't call it a weapon, a sword, an implement. It's very hard for someone to be sexually inappropriate towards a child who's trained how to use a weapon. Um, ironically, when you look at shooting, 
people in shooting are very aware of the fact that there are opportunities to target children for harm. If I was an offender, I wouldn't target a child who has a firearm. Like, I just don't understand how that could be a potential risk. But when you look at things like normalised sexual cultures, there are lots of sports that sadly have a uniform that sexualise young boys or girls or just girls. And that's a reality. The World Surfing League, uh, if anyone who watches professional surfing, released a policy this year that said because a lot of the women are wearing and they claim they choose to wear a G-string or the, you know, their sponsors will say them, you look better in a G-string or a very small bikini, and other female surfers said, I'm wearing board shorts and a rash vest because that's how I compete. And like in tennis, they get far less sponsorship dollars and corporate endorsement than they do for the women who wear a smaller uniform. But the World Surf League came out and said, because it's inappropriate in certain circumstances, we're going to not film at close-up close level the girls who are competing. And the girls straight away said, that doesn't make sense. So you're going to televise our uh, competition live, but it's a broad shot. So it's a shot from 200 metres away where they don't zoom in. So you see a very small little person competing on a wave. That doesn't make sense. Let's, let's manage the way that the organisation could do it better for these young women and say, we give you freedom of choice as to what you wear. Or at a minimum, we would prefer you wear a certain uniform as opposed to your corporate sponsor saying you have to wear a highly sexualised uniform. And a lot of people say that's just the way it is. Look at our blossoming equality in, in all sorts of sports in regard to prize money. You know, if you sat there and said 20 years ago, my dad's a tennis fan, my dad loves tennis, my dad's very misogynistic, uh, I've got three sisters and he lost every, every argument we ever had in our house in regard to why misogyny works. And years ago he said to me, women play three sets, men play five, why should there be parity in regard to the prize money? And automatically the response from our house was, the women's final sells out quicker than the men's. And we were talking about this earlier today. Men's tennis is boring. Let's just serve 45 aces and win a title. Women's tennis is exciting. It's enthralling. There are rallies. People prefer to watch that. They don't prefer to watch the men's. So when you look at prize money, we are evolving. We need to evolve in regard to uniforms because kids growing up in the context of a sporting scenario are effectively told you must wear a particular type of uniform and they feel uncomfortable. And you see sports having drop-off when children, young girls especially, reach puberty. They go, I'm not comfortable wearing that, so I won't compete anymore. And again, that's your market share loss. That's when you're losing market share as a result. Um, a couple of other things that really were evident in the Royal Commission before we move into child safe systems and, and, and what, what hopefully will work. Any adult who has a very powerful position in an organisation, whether that be a school or a sport or a church or a religious organisation, I'm not saying they pose a risk, but what comes with powerful positions is the ability to defend your position against a child's uh, account or their allegation. And in a sporting context, they identified in lots of sectors, including uh, the sporting context at the, the Royal Commission. If I'm in a trusted, powerful position within a sport, it's harder for a child to make allegations against me. Because I can tell them, look at the way people respect me. Look at the way that I'm treated in this organisation. Um, it's before the court, so I'm limited in what I can say, but the Scott Volkers allegations is a prime example. Um, Scott Volkers was a very high level elite swimming coach for most of his career, but set aside certain time of the week to only train eight to 12 year old girls. And the Royal Commission identified that he didn't offer those training sessions to boys. It was eight to 12 year old girls. And they effectively put it to Swim Australia and Swim Queensland. Didn't anyone pick up on the fact that that's an abnormal behaviour? That's a scenario that not a lot of swimming coaches engage in, especially in a corporate or commercial scenario. You want as many swimmers as possible in your squad because they're paying fees for that coaching. But to set aside certain times for certain cohorts is, is a change of behaviour that should be identified. My interpretation is Scott Volkers was incredibly um, beneficial to Swimming Queensland and Swimming Australia, and that's just my opinion. But when you look at the Royal Commission study that they had, the case study, and, they, and you look at the evidence that was provided, there are a lot of people saying, we lose a lot if this is true. We lose a lot. We lose Scott Volkers, we lose reputation, we lose, uh, there's brand damage that's applied to this. And in the, the byproducts or the outcome of that is the young victims aren't believed or they're told to go away or they're told there isn't enough evidence to suggest this occurred. Valuing adults over your broader organisation is risky. And a lot of organisations will sit there and say, you know, if anyone raised concerns about child sexual abuse, we'd suspend that person until further notice. 
And what if they are, you know, the Australian captain in your sport? What if they are the most endorsed person? What if they are the chair of the board? What if they offended 30 years ago and they're now the best coach in the sport? Has your sport mapped for the fallout? Has your sport mapped for half of your board or more saying, what if the child's lying? Because believe it or not, 30 years ago in child protection agencies, your starting point was we have to prove the child's not lying. And we've evolved from that, but the reality is it used to start from kids lie about this. And Australian Criminal Bureau statistics indicate that for adults and child allegations of sexual harm, less than 5% of cases turn out to be vexatious or false. And I know you sit there and go, 5%? That's a lot? It's not a lot. That's saying 9 out of 10. More than 9 out of 10 victims are telling the truth. And children don't really get a lot out of vexatiously lying about adults. They don't get anything. People will say, oh, they weren't selected or they missed out or this, that or something. Why would a child put themselves through that? Why would they say, you know what, I'm going to allege my coach sexually abused me and then I'm going to spend the next year with police and going in and out of court and having to recount my uh, a story of what occurred and I lied and fabricated about it. But a lot of organisations through the Royal Commission findings said, we've got an allegation here, do we believe it? Because we lose a lot if that adult is terminated or suspended and it turns out it wasn't the case. They're lying or it's fabricated or false. Any questions about all that information so far? Okay. A couple of things. Uh, if you haven't seen the Child Safe Standards that the Royal Commission released, the Child Safe Standards, they've released 10 of them and they relate to all sectors and industries. So they didn't release Child Safe Standards specific to sport. However, they are very beneficial to have a look at in regard to the context of sport generally. Now, I'm one of those people who doesn't like to do all the work for you. So yes, you'll get a copy of this presentation. Yes, you'll get links to information that uh, will be readily available. For example, the Royal Commission website and a few others like Play by the Rules and the Office of Sport, Recreation and, and, and Racing. But for me, for you to go back and talk in your organisation, please use the information that the Royal Commission provide. The 10 standards are very good standards. They're, I guess the best way I can describe it is they're triangulated. They look at before you engage someone, while someone's engaged, and if for any reason something goes wrong and you need to take action against someone. The standards have been uh, recommended. They aren't enforced at a federal or Commonwealth level. You have child safe environment standards or regulations that apply here in South Australia. If you're from Victoria, you have them as well. Uh, nationally, national organisations don't have them. It gets complex if you are operating out of Adelaide or Victoria and you're a national organisation. And I wouldn't be able to give you advice as to where you sit there, but I'd seek some advice. A couple of other things to think about from a, a, a sporting context, they have identified and the Australian Sports Commission have already uh, started the groundwork for having a one-stop shop from a national point of view for child safe processes and standards and systems. So they're doing a lot of work. There are a lot of national sports who have already engaged in a lot of work. Swimming Australia, Surf Life Saving Australia, Tennis Australia, quite a few others. Play by the rules, if you haven't been to play by the rules before, to give you an idea of how beneficial Play by the Rules is, 57 public hearings at the Royal Commission. Gail Finesse was senior counsel representing the Commonwealth Government. Uh, she's an incredibly formidable barrister. She's very good at what she does. Uh, I've met her once outside of work. She smiles a lot. At the Royal Commission, understandably, she didn't smile a lot. In the sports hearing in, December, in April 2016, over the course of three weeks, she systematically referred to member protection and play by the rules in a positive context. She kept coming back to all of the work the Royal Commission has done to scrutinise and investigate harm in sport. They kept coming back to the fact that play by the rules serves a great purpose. And play by the rules is free. It'll always be free. The reality is that any organisation can use their resources, tools and guides. If you haven't been on the website, please not only yourselves go on the website, encourage your stakeholder groups, your associations and clubs to use it. It does all the work for you. It does the child safe work for you. It does the anti-discrimination, anti-racism, inclusion, um, diversity, all sorts of scenarios, complaint and it gives you very practical examples of how to handle things well, both reactively if something goes wrong, but also from a prevention point of view. Play by the Rules has free training that anyone can do 24 hours a day online training, child protection in sport training takes about 45 minutes. There are sports right now in Australia that if you're a player or a coach and you are suspended for, you know, for example, abusing a young official, so uh, an official who's under 18, they will, the sport will say, you've been suspended for four weeks, 
but if you go and do the free online uh, child protection in sport training or uh, respect for officials training, we'll reduce that to two weeks. So go get your certificate and bring it back to us and you can be back on the field in two weeks. And the account of players, for example, junior players, their response is they say they sit there and they go, I hate... I hate my sport, I hate the sanctions, I hate the tribunal, and they do the play by the rules training. And they actually come out of it and go, oh, I'll admit that I learned a bit, and then your rates of recidivism or the rates of re-offending in the same behaviour, greatly reduced. Because they actually learn about how detrimental it is to abuse an official or to assault another player who's under the age of 18. So play by the rules is fantastic. A Couple of other things to think about. So now, what can we learn from the Royal Commission and how do you apply it locally? And this is where I'm gonna ask a few questions, and trust me, Yes, it's been filmed, but it's not about saying who's right or wrong or who's not doing enough. It's just to give you an idea of what's going on in sport. A code of conduct, as you all probably know, works very, very well in sport. And if you don't know the benefit of a code of conduct, the best analogy I can give you is if I leave here today and on the way to the airport I stop off somewhere like, say, an RSL or a club, and I want to get a roast of the day, so I want to get an early feed, I can't walk into the RSL with my shoes and shirt off and say, I want a roast of the day. They're gonna stand there at reception and go, I'm sorry, sir, you're not fit for service. You don't have a shirt or shoes on, so you can't come in. And your code of conduct effectively does the same thing. It says to people, welcome. So RSLs are very welcoming. Come on in, we serve roast of the day, but you can't actually get a roast of the day, even if you wanna pay for it, unless you meet our standards, you meet our expectations. Your code of conduct sets a universal benchmark for what you want from behavior. We all have our own moral benchmark. And most people have a moral benchmark that will either meet your code of conduct or go beyond it. It will supersede it. But let's use an example. If I grew up in a home, I didn't, but if I grew up in a home where uh, I come home from school in the afternoon and mum comes home from work soon after and dad isn't home yet and I'm disrespectful and rude to mum. She says, oh, I'll do your homework and I'm like, nah, shut up, go away. And mum then says to dad when he gets home 10 minutes later, Morgan was rude to me this afternoon. And we sit down to dinner and I'm sitting in my dinner and dad clips me across the back of the head. Don't disrespect your mum, that's inappropriate. If I learnt that through my childhood and that happened periodically or a lot, unless someone tells me that I can't physically assault children in your sport, I will normalise that behaviour. And if my team are training and two of the kids are mucking around and not paying attention and I clip one across the back of the head, your sport is going to say, oh, that's dangerous, it's catastrophic, a child's been harmed. But my response will be, I didn't hurt them, I didn't bruise them or cut them. It's quite effective to slap a child across the back of their head. It gets them to pay attention. That's what I grew up with. So sometimes people's moral benchmark will sit below your standards of behaviour or your code of conduct. So do your codes of conduct, for example, actually unpack what is physical assault? Because a lot of codes of conduct will say, do not physically assault a child. Now your interpretation of physical assault and mine can be very different. If I grew up in a home where a clip across the back of the head was effective, I won't view that as assault. In a lot of states and territories of Australia, even to your own child, striking them above the shoulders is assault as a parent. But if I come to your sport and I don't know it, and it doesn't actually get explained to me, or the code of conduct doesn't expand on what is physical assault, I will have my own moral interpretation. I'm not saying there are good and bad codes of conduct, but I've seen codes of conduct that will say, we don't permit any adults to physically assault a child. For example, hit, kick, strike, bite, eye gouge, pull hair, choke, throw a child across the room or floor. And there's no harm in actually being descriptive and prescriptive about what you mean when you say physical assault. So think about with your codes of conduct whether you actually expand on what, when you say don't psychologically harm a child, we could all have a discussion for an hour on where those grey benchmarks set in regard to psychological harm. And you're never gonna come to an ironclad, this is what psychological harm is and this is what it isn't within our sport. But things like physical assault can be easily defined. You can get definitions everywhere. Things like sexually inappropriate behaviour can be defined quite easily as well. You can look at criminal codes, you can look at standards that apply to what's called reportable conduct or things like school teacher handbooks and codes of conduct. There are lots of good descriptions. The New South Wales Teachers Handbook for the last 15 years has an excellent definition in it in regard to sexual assault. And it says, as a teacher, you're in a position of power and authority over your students. You cannot, so it doesn't say do not allow. You cannot, as a teacher, have any intimate or sexual contact with a child, whether heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, whether condoned or otherwise. 
And effectively, the only reason they have that in there is because they would have had teachers previously, believe it or not, saying, I didn't think that rule applied because it, it was me in a, in a gay scenario or a lesbian scenario. I didn't think that applied because the parents consented or knew that we were in a sexual relationship. I didn't think it applied because they were over 18 or over, over 16 or sometimes over 18. It's very clear. If you have a student and you're a teacher, no sexual contact. They don't just say no sexual contact with a student. They actually unpack it and they describe what they mean by it. Those sorts of things are effective in codes of conduct. I'm interested to find out, and again, it's not, a, it's not an assessment or test, uh, who uses an electronic acknowledgement for their code of conduct for their, their adults involved in junior sport? Who uses a scenario where you register and you tick a box? A few. It's great, because a lot of people do like to read terms and conditions. Uh, when Hotmail came out in 1994, my sister, my older sister, said to me, there's a new way that you can actually send messages to people through the computer. And I was like, no, there isn't. That's amazing. She said, there is, and it's free. And I said, no, we have to be careful. It sounds free, but we're probably going to get hit with fees. I was 14 or 15, but three lawyers in the family, so you always have to be guarded and careful. No disrespect to the lawyers in the room. So I read the 41 pages of terms and conditions for Hotmail online, and guess what? It's free, and it always was free. And it cost us about $40 in download for me to read that 41 pages. But the reality is I'm one of those people who's fascinated with reading terms and conditions. Most of your adults in your sports don't read the code of conduct if it's online. And most of your sports get people to access the code of conduct when they join. So if I'm a coach and I sign up, here's the code of conduct. If I'm returning, maybe next year, I'll get a copy of the code of conduct online. If people aren't signing it and dating it, they tend to plead ignorant. Oh yeah, that online stuff, I didn't really read it. I, sort of, I, I quickly skimmed over it. It was Friday afternoon at work. You know, you were forcing me to do it. You were, you were chasing me up to make sure I complied. So I haven't really read much of it. There's no harm in actually inducting people on the code of conduct. When you have a job and you get a job, most people are inducted. And as you know, even in the organisations represent today, induction isn't the first half an hour of your job. The induction usually is over a week or a couple of weeks and different people do it. You can do that in sport. You can compel your stakeholders, like your clubs and your associations, to actually have induction processes, probation processes. They take a little bit of time, but they're free to do. And they greatly reduce inappropriate people getting access to kids. Because if I want to target kids in your sport, I'll do my homework. I'll look at your websites, I'll look at your recruitment ads, I'll look at the way that you engage adults, I'll ask adults who are engaged in your sport. So when I join, what do I need to do? Working with Children Check. Easy, no worries. I've never been caught before. I've got one of those. And amazingly, you probably don't realise this, but when working with children check systems or criminal record checking systems change and the government change them, customer service teams for those agencies will get calls from people who say, I was convicted of sexual assault of an eight-year-old in 86. Am I still ineligible to get a working with children check? So they'll ring up and actually ask whether they can now access kids. And it shocked me when I used to work in the customer service team and people ring up and say, oh, I've got multiple convictions, but now that you've changed the law, can I get a clearance? Am I allowed to work with kids? And you sit there and think, this is not something I thought I'd have a conversation about. So people who have a predisposition to target kids keep an eye on the landscape. They look at the way that you operate. If you have child safe systems, talk about them, advertise them, put them on social media. We have a zero tolerance for people being inappropriate towards kids. Come and join our organisation. People like that. Parents like that. But a lot of powers to be and boards and CEOs always say, or not always, but a lot say, let's not talk about the negative stuff. Let's not talk about child sexual harm. That, 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 you know, that doesn't occur. We don't want people to think it occurs. It does occur, but we're on the front foot. Um, Surf Life Saving Australia are here at this conference. They've launched a video only in the last month. The video is literally about let's have the tough conversations. And from a preventative point of view, let's have the tough conversations about what do we do if someone does the wrong thing? Let's plan for it at our meetings now. And they have a survivor of child sexual abuse within Surf Lifesaving give his story. So actually recount what occurred to him. And his biggest thing when he, he talks about it, he says, people, people just didn't believe it. They didn't want to think that it could have occurred. It's hard, but you need to go back and say to people, this could occur or maybe it has occurred. What are we doing to ensure it doesn't occur? And your code of conduct plays a very key role, a huge role. I see more value in your code of conduct than I do a working with children check system. And I worked in the working with children check system for 10 years. In New South Wales, in five years, they had 
close to 3 million adult applicants apply in five years, just under 3 million. And 4,000 people were disqualified by law. So it works out to be about 0.0014% of the applications. So 99.86% of people who apply get a clearance. There hasn't been a reduction in people arrested for sexually harming kids, even though everyone has to get a working with children check. So the check doesn't prevent all risk. It stops people with known convictions and criminal history from gaining access to your kids. But the person that keeps me up at night, having four boys, is the person that I described earlier. I work for an organisation that's trusted and people like and respect. I have no criminal history. I have access to kids. And what if I did the wrong thing? Will people believe that child? Will they believe that I'm capable of doing it? The, the way that you shift it is, a code of conduct is an entry point. It's the ability for you to say to people, irrespective of your experience in your sport or in other areas of your life, here's the behaviour we expect from all our adults. And if you breach that, there's a consequence. Second thing to think about, when we talk about professional standards, within your staff um, in point of view, and we talk about the way in which risks are managed, your SSO or your national sport, so your state sport or your national sport, can lead the way in demonstrating that behaviour. So um, we were talking in the break earlier today uh, and a lot of organisations will say, I'll send one staff member along to this, this conference. You know, a, a, we can only afford one staff member or B, everyone else is too busy running our sport. Inclusion and diversity, as we've heard through the whole day and a half, two days, is, is a whole of organisation cultural response. And it's the same with Child Safe. So it's not about one person going, what are our risks and how do I identify them and how do I then mitigate them? It's the whole organisation coming together and saying, what do we know about the risks within our organisation? What has the Royal Commission told us? Royal Commission has told you in black and white, overnight trips are dangerous. Some sports already knew that. Quite a few already knew that. But lots of sports tend to say, oh, we take kids away and it's a wonderful experience and nothing's ever gone wrong. That you know of. So managing those risks shouldn't just be I'm at the state organisation, we have clubs that go on overnight trips, I'll get the play by the rules guideline, which is about overnight stays and trips, and I'll send that out to the clubs. And therefore we've met our responsibility. No, ask kids about what their experience is like on overnight trips. Ask kids what could we do differently so that you feel more comfortable when you travel away with our sport. And you'll get lots of good insights from kids, because I wouldn't be able to tell you what your kid's experience is like. I'm not one of those children, I've never been on those trips. So when you look at your physical and online risks, ask kids what they think is risky. Kids will say to you, oh, social media. And most people go, social media is Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter. But then do you know about High Calculator, Yellow, I Love Pink, Ask FM, Yik Yak Messaging, all these other platforms? Because I didn't know about it until I went on the eSafety Commission's website. And they've got a parent portal. It actually says, come back here every couple of weeks because there'll be new social media apps that kids are using every couple of weeks. So a lot of social media codes of conduct or guidelines that talk about codes of conduct for social media or policies and procedures will say social media is, and they set scopes, play at Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat. Awesome, if you set that scope, I'll access kids through Ask FM or Yik Yak Messaging or High Calculator. And then if you say I've breached the policy, I'll go, no, I was using High Calculator. The policy talks about Facebook and Instagram. That's what you said was in, within scope. The platform I'm using isn't within scope. So just use the term social media. Use electronic platform. Use things that, that, that criminal codes use. Electronic device. So rather than saying social media, if you access kids through an electronic device, laptop, computer, iPad, uh, you know, notebook, phone, whatever, encrypted, whatever, doesn't matter. You don't do it in our organisation. Or we set rules and guidelines for your interaction with kids through those platforms. That's how you map the risks, by learning from kids, learning from agencies that oversee it. Because I wouldn't be able to tell you what the risks are. I'm fascinated by it, I'm constantly thinking about it, but risks emerge. Every time you make it hard for, for someone to access kids through a particular platform, they'll use another platform to do it. For those who don't know Snapchat when it was originally designed, the designers of Snapchat went before Congress and said, it's a safer way for kids to take naked photos of themselves and send it to other people. They said, that's the design of the app. That's the goal, to make it safer for kids to take naked photos. And everyone, parents, say, what a horrible app. But the reality is, they were right. It's safer for me as a 12-year-old to take a naked photo of myself that, that I can do in my own home without anyone else around and send it to my potential partner 
rather than taking my, my clothes off in front of my partner in their bedroom. So it sounds nuts, but it actually works. Snapchat is now the world's leading marketing tool. Radio stations and councils all have a Snapchat account and they're not setting naked photos of themselves or staff. They are actually advertising their organisation through them. So Facebook and social media and platforms evolve. And when they evolve, don't try and think that you know the risks. Periodically ask kids what the risks are. Engage kids to tell you what social media platforms people in your sport use. And kids will say, oh, last year, some random referee contacted us through Yik Yak messaging and we just went, get lost and blocked him. Good to know about that because you won't find out any other way than asking kids about it. A couple of other things. Seek feedback from kids. And when we talk about inclusion, I mentioned it yesterday, not many organisations have clear processes or procedures for asking for feedback from kids. Some do and it's evolving. Uh, they're actual government agencies that their portfolio is to literally get feedback from children and tell government. There's a national children's commissioner. There are state-based children commissioners. There are territory children's commissioners, children's guardians. Their mandate by law and through parliament is to say, go and engage and consult with kids and come back and tell us what they need. And they do things like, if the council is gonna design a new park area and skate park, they don't go, council maintenance officers know how to design a skate park. They ask kids, what skate parks have you seen that you like, send us photos, and then we'll get those people to come and design this one because they want best value for their dollar and they want kids to be at the skate park because they get less complaints about kids throwing rocks through the shop windows and all that sort of thing. So there's all these layers of the way that consultation are beneficial. Within sport, if you engage with kids regularly and informally, whether it be through SurveyMonkey online, as silly as it sounds, having a suggestion box, so your sport's actually having a suggestion box, it works. Having chats to kids, using social media platforms like Facebook, to pose a question and say, please message us in your response. All of those things are beneficial to find out what it's like for kids, but the byproduct is children feel more comfortable raising alarms. So a child who feels they have an ability or a mechanism or a system to say something's gone wrong is far more likely to raise an alarm. More than an authoritarian type organisation that says when you turn up, you do as you're told and you don't really have a say in anything that goes on here. The Australian cadets were part of the Royal Commission. So the Navy and Army cadets had horrific cases of abuse, physical abuse and sexual assault of children in cadets because parents said, oh, you need a bit of discipline, go off to the cadets program in, in, in the holidays. Authoritarian, do as you're told, no matter what, you don't disclose what, what goes on here. Those sorts of scenarios are highly risky for kids. So in the context of trying to make it hard for adults to do the wrong thing, if I want to offend against kids in your sport and I find out you ask kids for feedback, I get worried that I can't control the communication. I get worried that I can't keep them to remain secret and not tell anyone else about what occurred last week, last month or last overnight trip. So the ability for kids to raise alarms usually comes about when you have a culture of we want to find out what it's like for you. You are not going to children and saying throughout the year, has someone sexually abused you? That's not the conversation you're having. You're saying to kids, you've been here now for 12 months, what do you like? What are three things you like? What are three things you don't like? And kids will say, I don't like the colour of the uniform, I love the fact that they sell chips at the canteen and I don't like this. And that feedback's great. You don't have to do anything with it, but getting feedback from kids builds a culture for children and young people to say, if something does go wrong, I know who I can go to. It might be my coach, so I can't go to my coach, but I know there's a member protection information officer. I know there's someone who's our child protection officer. I know there's a platform where I can email someone. But as I said yesterday, kids don't formally complain. Kids don't email your CEO or go to the state member or go to the federal sports minister and say, something's gone wrong in my sport, I need to alert you to it. Kids will have conversations with people. Kids quite often will have conversations with their friends and their friends will want to disclose what they know about what has occurred. And you need to have mechanisms to be able to say to all of your players and participants, if you're ever stressed, you're ever worried, you're ever scared or you're ever unsure about our sport and what goes on, come and talk to us. Come and talk to us doesn't have to be formal, doesn't have to be anything other than a chat. You then need to map, if you are having informal conversations with kids and they disclose a potential risk, who's going to be responsible for mandatory reporting if you have those obligations? Who's going to be responsible for putting support around that young victim or their friend or the family who's involved, etc.? So you need to start to map the whole process from start to finish before people are engaged, code of conduct, reducing your risk, preventative, 
now we're starting to get into that, that landscape of what do we do if something goes wrong. When we talk about what do we do if something goes wrong, as I mentioned before, it's not your role or my role to determine whether a child is lying. If a child builds up the courage and has the ability to go to anyone in your organisation and say something has gone wrong, violence, sexual assault, inappropriate behaviour, peer-to-peer risk, peer-to-peer harm, social media inappropriate behaviour, simply believe the child. A, not many children ever lie about it, and B, it's not your responsibility to investigate. Your responsibility is to seek advice. And the Royal Commission was very clear in all sectors, criticising organisations for saying, at what point did you decide to contact police? In the um, Victorian Broken Rights Inquiry, which came before the Royal Commission, so it was looking into religious organisations and sexual harm, the Commissioner of Victorian Police was subpoenaed to go on the stand at the Parliamentary Inquiry and he said, before I answer questions, I'd just like to make one statement. From the moment this inquiry commenced, I took a team of staff offline and said, go back to the history of timing when we've archived reports to police. So I need you to find the date in which we started to detail and document people raising concerns with police, reporting crime. And he said, when you get to that point, systematically go through what probably was hard copy documents every single day since then and find for me a time, and, and I'm, I'm agnostic, I'm not being critical of sectors or industries or, or religions, but he said, find for me a time that the Anglican or Catholic Church in Victoria reported sexual abuse of a child. Find me these examples, because I will need these when I go before the parliamentary inquiry. And his statement to the parliamentary inquiry was, we are more than happy to answer criticism of police not doing enough, but since 1931, we have not found a single time that anyone representing the Catholic Church or the Anglican Church notified police of sexual abuse of a child. Not once. Children came forward, families came forward, no one representing these organisations notified police. So how are the police at fault if no one's told us about crime that's occurred? It's not any sport's responsibility to determine whether a crime has taken place. You ring the police assistance line. Most states, it's 131444. And it should be one of those phone numbers that is accessible to everyone. I ring them in my work at least once a week. Someone rings me and says, we believe this has occurred, what do we do? My response, give me an hour. I'll call you back in an hour. My first call will be to police. This is what I know so far. This is what a child has disclosed. You tell me what I need to tell that sport. And the police will say, okay, what do we know so far? Blah, blah, blah. And their process commences. But too many organisations, including sports, will have allegations and then say, let's call a special meeting of the board next Wednesday and we'll decide our course of action. We won't offer any support to that family. We'll tell that family, thank you for letting us know. We'll get back to you. We won't suspend the person who's alleged to have done the wrong thing because we can't do that yet because our special meeting of the board needs to determine whether this is accurate, whether it's fair, and we need to balance all our, our responsibilities. Your responsibility is to children. If, if you have people within your organisation, I know some of you will, you'll go back and talk to your superiors and they'll say, well, there's always a balance here and I'm not the person to have that conversation with them because I'm quite blunt about it, but you can be. Simply say to them, let's have a look at what the Royal Commission identified. The Royal Commission identified organisations wait to call police. And police can't act without evidence. Police can't go and persecute someone and slander them and defame them without evidence. But everyone worries about it. What if we're sued for defamation or slander? If it's accurate and true and there's evidence someone did the wrong thing, that's not defamation and slander. That's you being responsible for your duty of care to kids. So in the context of sports, a lot of sports have historically gone, we need to figure out whether that child's telling the truth. It's not your role and it's not my role. And people involved in the organisation need to understand that as well. Last thing, there's a lot of systems that talk about when you report, how you report, when you meet a threshold in regards to reporting. Things like mandatory reporting. And for those that don't know, mandatory reporting effectively are systems in different states and territories that talk about if you identify a particular level of risk for a child, so you identify they are at risk, and it could be internally within your sport, or it could be their family-based um, scenario that, that poses the risk. And people say, I'm then obligated by law to notify an agency. The biggest thing there is, I, I encourage you to understand that organisations shouldn't be determining when you report. Raise concerns. There are helplines. They're not mandatory reporting lines, they're helplines. So child protection statutory agencies in all states and territories or the police assistance line actually focus on, we're here to provide assistance to you. We're not here to document your identified incident of report. You ring them up and say, we have concerns. You're not obligated to be involved in an investigation. They don't compel you to provide evidence. 
you're just notifying your concerns. And your coaches, especially across the board, should be educated about if your gut tells you something's wrong, seek advice. Talk to someone. It might be talk to someone within your sport. It might be talk to an external agency. But the Royal Commission identified people who volunteered or worked alongside other adults and they didn't like their conduct or behaviour, they were suspicious of it, but they said it's not my role or responsibility or I don't feel comfortable raising those concerns. Or children started to change in their behaviour. Children started to shift from their normal interaction behaviour with their sport to being very apprehensive and cautious and worried around particular adults or their family, but it's not my respons responsibility to notify about that. Everyone's responsibility is to notify or raise concerns. And it's the statutory agency's responsibility to investigate. It's not your or my responsibility to investigate. If it doesn't meet a criminal threshold or a mandatory reporting threshold, then your internal systems will hold investigations. But when we're talking about child harm, physical violence, sexual assault, neglect, psychological harm, nine times out of 10, the agency will take the lead role there. They won't be pushing it back to you to say, sorry, we don't have a role to play. Your, your peak body, the Office of Sport and Recreation, your government agency representative, they have so many tools and resources available. South Australia, in my opinion, has led the way for the last 10 years on tools and resources that you can all implement, effectively plagiarise, like legally plagiarise great stuff. Go and grab it and implement it in your organisation. Put your logo on it. Say, here's our response to allegations of child sexual abuse. There's been a document that's been out for over five years. Great document. And your board should be across that because your board is the first place of panic when an allegation of child sexual abuse is, comes up. It's the first place that they say, what do we do? And by the time you get to what do we do, the media and the community are already scrutinising you. They're already well in their, in their scenario of you don't know what you're doing and we're going to hold you to account as a result. So when we talk about preventative tools, there's lots of systems. When we talk about reactive tools, there are lots of systems as well. Last couple of things I'll talk about. Yesterday, for you in my session, we talked about child-focused practice. Think about what it's like for a child in your sport. Best way to map child safe systems. What do kids experience? What do they like? What don't they like? What could we be better at? So don't overthink this. Don't go you know, around the world and go, right, we've got to find the perfect system to manage risk to kids. Ask your kids what they don't like, and they'll tell you. It might take a while for them to tell you, but they will tell you. Surf Life Saving Victoria last year held youth forums, and they invited young participants in Surf Life Saving to come along in between 12 and 17 years of age. And we were chatting about how would you like information from Surf Life Saving to be sent to you. And I was thinking Instagram, Snapchat, and a 14 year old girl goes, I'd love something to be mailed to me. I'd love something addressed to me in the mail. And I said, that's interesting. Like I wouldn't think you guys would like mail. And they all went, we never get mail. Like mail is not something that we're used to. And she said, I check the mailbox a lot. And I thought my 14 year old comes home from school every day and checks the mailbox. And I don't know why. He's looking for something with his name on it. He never gets anything. So Surf Life Saving Victoria went, oh my gosh, we could actually get new members or returning members, young kids, 50% of their, their, their members, and send them something at the start of the year addressed to them in hard copy, like an actual letter and guideline from Play By The Rules. We could send it to them. It costs a little bit, but we could send it to them. And that's a, a, a shift away from the 4,000 things they follow on Instagram. So how do you get your traction on Instagram when they follow 4,500 products and tools and people? Um, Kim Kardashian isn't sending them a letter in the mail. You guys could, and how beneficial would that be? So think about it from a child's perspective. Don't think about it from an adult's perspective. It's a great way to apply good child safe practices. Uh, two more things. Your response, if there are allegations, is hugely critical. And the Royal Commission indicated that when we talk about trauma-informed responses, think about the victim. Think about a child. If a child comes forward and says, I've been harmed, think about them. You'll have other people say, think about the reputation of the organisation. Think about our brand. Think about the consequences. Forget about those. Think about the child. If people in your organisation can't do that, best way to describe it to them is, what if it was your child? So you'll come up against resistance. Like inclusion, you'll come up against resistance. Why do we need to do work with recently arrived communities? Because it's A, a great thing to do, and B, increasing market share. But you'll have people say, oh, well, I hold my own predisposition and thoughts about recently arrived people. Well, what if that was your family? What if you left Australia and went somewhere else and you were treated that way? It's the same with kids. If you have anyone who resists it, what if your child was the child who came forward? And it puts a very different landscape in their mind about how they would respond. A huge thing for me is kids should be placed before all other considerations. So a child hasn't done the wrong thing. A child doesn't actively go out and seek to be harmed. They are targeted by people who harm kids. 
So in the context of children, they haven't done anything wrong. And when they raise a concern, it's an enormously brave thing to do. So in the context of what are we going to do as a response, support a child. Worst thing you can do, this is really traumatic for you, so we understand that you don't want to come back. Most children want to come back. They want their normal routine. They want to participate. They want to train. They want to stay amongst their peer group. They just don't want that potential adult to harm them again. But a lot of sports will respond with, we'll take action. Let's, let's tell that family to just sit on it and don't come back right now. We'll seek legal advice and we'll also tell the alleged perpetrator or the adult who's done the wrong thing, they can't, they, they're suspended as well. Why is the child being punished for coming forward and saying something? And a lot of organisations don't map for how would we manage that. The child might not want to come back to that club, but they might want to join another club mid-season. Does your constitution and bylaws allow a child to transfer? Because lots of sports have transfer rules. No anti-competition and blah, 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 and people poach students and, 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 and players. Forget about that. This child has been harmed and it's, it's been traumatic. Can we then embed them in another club where they can still be involved, but you're going to have a long, drawn-out process in regard to the follow-up? and what's going to occur. So flexibility around your responses is important as well. Last thing I'll talk about. It takes a village to raise a child. People would have heard me say this yesterday. It takes a whole organisation like a sport to protect all children. This is not the role of one person. I loved all the silo terminology yesterday. Siloing is horrible in this context. It's not your portfolio. Inclusion, diversity and child safe is not one person's portfolio. Everyone who works there, like Workplace Health and Safety. Is anyone else mildly obsessed and passionate about Workplace Health and Safety like me? There's always one or two. See, everyone else goes, no way, but there's always a couple. And it's one of those things you don't, you don't opt into. When I was 19, I was elected the chair of where I worked in absenteeism. So while I didn't go to a staff meeting, they elected me chair of the Workplace Health and Safety Commission, or the committee. And I was like, that sounds great. And they go, it's the worst thing ever sucked in. It's going to be horrible. And I learn about Workplace Health and Safety. Once you learn about it, you become quite passionate about it. Because if you're in aviation, workplace health and safety is critical. If you're in mining, people die. In sport, everyone now has a workplace health and safety responsibility. A lot of them don't know it, but you're all legally obligated. Child safe is the same. People have a great respect for workplace health and safety now, even in volunteer land. They need to have a great respect for child safe systems. Because if all adults are responsible for it, it makes it very hard for an adult to do the wrong thing. If I wanted to come into your sport and target kids, and I find out a lot of people know about the value of a code of conduct, the fact that kids should be empowered to raise alarms, I get nervous about the idea of you catching me out or me being caught doing the wrong thing. If everyone's responsible for it, hard for adults to do the wrong thing. The content that I spoke about today is confronting. Uh, I've, I've, I've started off with that and I'll finish off with it. Please, if after today you find that over the next few days you're thinking about things like statistics of child sexual abuse, it could be your own experience, it could be someone who's close to you who has experienced, it might not be an experience of your own. But if this weighs heavily on you, please debrief. If you have the employee assistance program in your organisation, they are very good at it. If you don't have the employee assistance program, Lifeline's misrepresented in the community. Everyone sees Lifeline as suicide prevention. Lifeline is free counselling for anyone about anything. So you can call them, you can go on their website. Beyond Blue are very good. They've got a diversified uh, a platform of, of highly specialised staff that can provide services for you. And as I said yesterday, Headspace is for anyone under the age of 25. If you're over the age of 25, just ring them and say you're 24 in nine months. They're not going to ask for your licence. They're very, very good at what they do as well. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to fill them. I think I'm running way over time, which I apologise for. Uh, if you need my contact details, I'm here for a little bit and then the coordinating uh, group have my contact details as well. So thank you.